Okay, the big things from lesson one are knowing the difference between the components of climate, that is temperature, precipitation, light, and wind, and the factors that affect those four components. Okay, the factors that you went over that affect how much your, or what your temperature is, well, how much rain you get, what your wind is like, all of that, okay, those are the factors. So the factors are your latitude, your altitude, and all those other ones you went over, you know, proximity to mountain barriers and oceans and uh, ocean currents, prevailing winds, all that kind of stuff. Okay, all of that stuff are factors that affect your climate. Okay, does so everyone follow me on that? And okay, what we're going to do tomorrow and Monday okay, is an activity with the climatograms, okay, which, you, which I talked about at the very end of the lesson, the graphs okay, that show the precipitation and temperature of the specific area. What we're going to be using those four is to figure out what factors affect the climate of various Canadian cities. So we'll be reviewing those factors and looking at, okay, well, this Canadian city's got a climate graph that looks like this, and it's located you know, right beside the Rocky Mountains. So if it's Calgary, we'd go, well, okay. So it's got, uh, it's close to the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, probably proximity to mountain barriers would be a factor that affects its climate. Okay, it would affect it in this way, makes it dry, windy, et cetera. All right, everyone follow on that? Okay, that's what we'll be looking at Thursday and Monday. We'll have the Chromebooks and we'll be working on an activity to do with that. Now, other things that are coming up for you here. Okay, we're gonna have that climatogram activity and that will likely be the last thing you hand in to me. Okay, um, you'll have your unit exam Monday, uh, June 13th. This unit is short, okay, like really short. So here's the, here's the good news about a really short unit. There's not very much on the unit exam. And it's worth the same amount as the other three. So study hard for it and you boost your exam mark considerably. Okay, before going into the final exam. So it's a good opportunity late in the year to get a little boost okay, going into the final exam. All right, so June 13th, keep that date in your head, okay, is going to be the date of that. Um, and likely your climate graph activity will probably get that done in class. That's my hope anyway. Okay? We should have enough class time to get that all finished, and it shouldn't be a matter of homework because what should you be doing already? Okay, and I don't mean like three hours a night, you know, whatever. You don't need to be doing that yet. But some good things to be starting on now would be getting your notes organized. All right, get your notes organized. Look through Google Classroom. Start, you know, maybe uh, if you like having paper, maybe print off paper copies of your labs, okay, and, and things like that that you've done. Kind of put them in the right places in your binder so that you can go through them as part of your review. Right? Now, I'm not saying that reading your notes is the be-all and end-all of studying for science, because it's not. Okay? It's one of the things you'll want to do. But you'll also want to look at worksheets that we've done okay, in class. You know, pick a couple of questions off of each, each worksheet. If you're not getting them right, that's probably something you should work on. If you're getting them all right, it's probably okay to move on to something else. Right? Um, I would suggest that you probably start looking at a bit of chemistry. It's been a while since we did that. Okay, and we've got to remember how to do the mole equation and balance and predict reactions and stuff like that. Okay, been a long time since we did that, so it's a good idea to go over that. Okay, and then maybe ask in scheduled help or at lunch over the next couple of weeks. Are you going to be having like study sessions? Yes, I am going to be having study sessions during exam week. Uh, next week, I'll kind of uh, set up some times. I'll look at the schedule and see when you guys are likely writing tests and make sure I have you know, sessions that offset those or that everyone can get to. For the most part, my policy on help during exams is email me and let me know when you're coming and I'll be here. Okay, it's pretty simple that way. We have to be here anyway. Okay, so just tell me when you're coming and I'll make sure I'm not, you know, helping somebody move their stuff or, you know, or supervising an exam. Actually, that shouldn't be a problem because I'm supervising your exam. So, okay, um, it should be, I should be easy to get a hold of during exam week. Just let me know you're coming so I know to be in the room at that time. Okay, and then you can get help. Questions there? Okay. So, solar energy and the environmental triad. So the triad is three things, right? Okay, and that's going to be the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere. So all the air, all the water, all the earth, okay, on planet earth, and how they interact and how they transfer energy. Energy transfers, I mean, that's been basically every unit. We didn't talk about it much in chemistry, but there was still a little bit of energy going on there. Okay, it was huge in the last unit. Okay, it's going to be big again here. 
So the three parts of the Earth, we already went over that. Lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere. Okay? Understand how energy on Earth is absorbed, used, and reflected. Remember those three terms. Okay? Sometimes when we talk about used, we also use the word converted. Okay? Um, three things can happen to solar energy when it hits the Earth. Those three things are, it could be absorbed, it could be used, or it could be reflected. Oh, that was oh. oh, because it used to be Unit 3, we changed the order, and I forgot to change the number. Yeah. We, started, we used to do physics last, but then it always got shortchanged, so we stopped doing it last. Yeah. Okay, um, so when light hits the Earth's surface, it can be absorbed, okay? it can be reflected, or it can be used or slash converted. What process does that? Photosynthesis. It strikes a plant, the plant converts it from solar energy into chemical energy, and that's what starts the food chains. Okay? If it wasn't for plants, there'd be nothing on Earth. Right? They supply the food for everything else. Right? They are the only organisms on Earth capable of converting the, the one source of energy we have into other forms of energy. Right? So without plants, things go wrong in a hurry. Right? That's why when we see in the fossil record things like you know, big cataclysms and stuff like that, it's usually the result of the sun being blocked out or disrupted or something like that by ash or dust or things like that. And that interrupts photosynthesis and then everything else dies. Okay? All right. What is going to determine how much absorption versus reflection happens? Okay, so how much, how cloudy it is. Okay, what else? Okay, how much water there is around. Yep, time of year. Okay, could also be part of it because we talked about that was latitude, right? The effect of latitude turning the earth, okay, or tilting the earth back and forth. Okay, the material, yeah, and what the surface is covered with. That's the biggest thing, okay? What does the surface look like where the solar energy is incident? That means where it hits, okay? So what we call that is albedo, okay? That word's going to show up here in another slide or two, okay? Uh, albedo is the reflectivity of the Earth's surface, right? When you take physics, you learn that um, light is made up of different wavelengths, okay? Visible light and, and there's, you know, X-rays and gamma rays and infrared rays, which are heat, okay? Things like that. Um, but light reflects off of light-colored surfaces and is absorbed by dark surfaces, all right? The example I used in, the, in this uh, before was if you have two cars that are sitting beside each other in a parking lot. One has a black interior and the other has a white interior or a light colored interior. Okay? When you get into the light colored interior car, it's gonna be cooler inside, all right? Because light colors tend to reflect the solar energy back as opposed to absorb it. Anything that's dark in color or black absorbs energy quickly, okay? Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen these, but sometimes they, they sell at like Canadian Tire, Walmart, or camping stores, these camp showers. And they're basically just a hot water bottle painted black. Okay, so it's just a square container of, that can hold water, and it's black. You put it in the sun, and it gets hot. And the water inside gets hot, and then you can have a hot shower as opposed to getting in the river that's cold. Okay, and it doesn't use any fuel because it just uses the sun's energy. Okay, now, if they made that white, it just wouldn't work. Okay, if it was a white water bottle, it wouldn't absorb any energy. It would reflect most of the heat away, and you'd have a cold shower. Well, you could have just gotten in the river for that. Okay, so that's kind of how those work. All right, if you ever look at, like, uh, coolers, okay, the inside of a cooler, it's typically what color? Yep. Okay, typically it's white. All right, that's what we want because it's going to absorb, or it's going to reflect away, okay, any heat, right? Everyone follow on that? All right, so the atmosphere, okay? Within the atmosphere, there's a bunch of different layers that I'm never going to ask you about. Right? I'm never going to ask you to label all of these layers. We live, and the most important one to us is the troposphere, okay? And that's the lower levels of the atmosphere where, you know, there's lots of oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide and stuff like that, okay? Um, what happens with the atmosphere is, obviously, it's made of a bunch of gases, okay? And um, it gets thinner the higher you go, 
Okay? This is the issue with being a climber. If you climb to the top of Mount Everest or K2 or any of the kind of major peaks in the world, um, you get essentially close to the upper limit or sometimes even out of the troposphere. And the pressure of the atmosphere is a lot less. Okay? What we feel is atmospheric pressure, that thing that makes your ears pop if you're going up and down hills. Okay? If you get to the point where that's low enough, the gases that are normally dissolved in your blood start to turn into gases again. They bubble. Okay? And that's really bad. Okay. If that happens, you get the bends. Okay. It happens to divers if they come up from depth too quickly. Okay. It happens to climbers if they climb too quickly. Okay. They get into this area where, where the gases in their blood start to come out. Okay. It's very, very painful. Um, but the other problem is, is that you lose a lot more water than you normally lose, and it's hard to keep it in your tissues. So it ends up building up in your lungs. Right? You essentially get pneumonia even though you're not sick. Right? Your lungs fill up with fluid, you get pulmonary edema, which means you start to get like blood clots and things like that okay? in, your, in your lungs, and your lungs fill with fluid, and you drown. Okay? I don't mean like there's actually, it's just it closes off the, the, the fluid pressure closes off your little alveoli, the little air sacs that normally exchange gas for you, okay? and then you can't breathe. You cough a lot. Usually what ends up happening is you cough so hard that you rupture the inside of your throat and it starts to bleed down into your lungs. It's bad. Okay? Um, that's why you see like really serious climbers always carry what they call dex. Okay, it's syringes, needles filled with dextamatorphan, which is a cough suppressant. It's in all it's in Buckley's and all the other kind of cough suppressants you can buy. But they take it not orally, they take it by injection in large amounts to keep them from coughing. Okay, because it can actually be a serious issue for them. Alright, so you don't want to get up that high. You can, you can go up there, but you can't live there. Okay? No one lives on the top of Mount Everest. You can't live. It's in what's called the death zone. Your body is slowly destroying itself at that altitude because it's not designed to stay up there. Okay? The gases and stuff just will not balance at that altitude. In fact, they, uh, climbers, when they make their meals at that altitude, okay, like at Camp 4 on Everest, the water boils at about 65 degrees. There's so little atmospheric pressure up there that water boils at a much lower temperature. So they actually eat boiling soup. Okay? Because it's not as hot as boiling soup would be down here, where it would be like 97 degrees. Okay? It's really weird. It's strange stuff. Okay? And, and if you go to places where there's even less atmospheric pressure, like on Mars, okay? if you went to the surface of Mars, you would just boil if you weren't wearing a suit. Okay? Because there's so little atmosphere there that all the gases in your blood would just become gases again and you'd pop. Okay? Yeah. It's, yeah. Explosive decompression. Not a way you want to go. Okay? Right up there on my list of ways I don't want to go. Okay? Yeah. No. I mean, the Sherpas live on Everest. They have, you know, they're, they're very barrel-chested. If you've ever seen a Sherpa, they have giant chests. And it's not because they have, they're muscular. It's because over, you know, hundreds of years, they've just, their, their people, their genetics have made them so that they have large lung capacity. They're very barrel-chested. Okay? Sherpas are the, the people that live on Everest. Yeah. The base camp. They, help, they're the, they get hired to carry gear up all the time. Yeah, altitude training is a, yeah, but that's more to do with you're running in lower oxygen, not not lower pressure, but lower oxygen. You come down to sea level and your blood carries more oxygen. Yeah, yeah. Saeed Ayueta is the guy that invented it. He was a Kenyan runner, ran on Mount Kilimanjaro all the time. Yeah. Okay, now, so atmospheric pressure, guys, is important, but more important than that is the role that the atmosphere plays in capturing and distributing solar energy. The atmosphere is made of gas, and gas is a fluid, not a liquid, but a fluid. Okay? And gases are more fluid than, what, than liquids are, so they move easily. All right? It's that easy movement that allows the atmosphere to do so much energy transfer, right? more than the solid part of the Earth or the liquid part of the Earth can do. Right? Um, now, other roles the atmosphere plays, obviously, the absorption of energy. As, as light comes through the atmosphere, it strikes things like clouds. It gets scattered. Okay? That's why the sky is blue. Right? It's because it scatters blue light. I know you probably got told somewhere along the way, it's because it reflects off the ocean, but it's not that. Okay? 
the ocean looks blue because it reflects the sky. Okay, but the ocean is clear. Really, if you doubt me, it is. It's not blue. It's clear. Okay, um, but it reflects the sky, so it looks blue on the surface. Okay, but what happens is certain wavelengths of light as they come through the atmosphere get blocked. Okay, which is good because we don't want those wavelengths of light to get through. That would be things like gamma rays, X rays, and ultraviolet rays. Okay, the, the composition of gases in the upper atmosphere reflects short wavelengths of light. So those things get out. They, they stay away. Right? Other things can penetrate through. Some UV penetrates through. Visible light, the stuff we can see, penetrates through. And heat penetrates through. Right? Gets down to the surface. Okay. So here's what we see. Okay? We've got incoming solar radiation. Some of it gets reflected by clouds. Obviously, the tops of clouds are white and fluffy. And anything that's white is going to reflect lots of light. So if it's an overcast day, it's usually cooler because most of the light's being reflected away by the tops of the clouds. Okay? That may not look white to us, but the tops of the clouds are white. Okay? Um, some of it is backscattered by the air, which again makes the sky blue, and some of it gets all the way through the atmosphere and, and gets reflected off of the surface. Now, here's where time of the year can affect albedo. Okay? So this diagram is showing for us the difference between summer and winter levels of light absorption. In the winter time, we have snow cover. Most of the time. We didn't have much this year, but usually we do. Okay? Well, snow is white. So it reflects away most of the light coming in. So you can see in this diagram here, it's 85 to 90% of light that is incident on snow gets reflected away. And 10% to 15% actually gets absorbed. Right? In the summertime, it's almost the exact opposite. In the summer, we've got grass, which is obviously going to be absorbing and converting energy rocks and soil, which are darker in color, so we're absorbing 70% of the energy, okay? reflecting about 10% off of watery surfaces and about 20% off of land-based surfaces. Okay? But it all depends what the ground in that area is made out of. Okay? If it's something highly reflective, then it's not going to absorb as much light. If it's something dark, it's going to absorb lots. All right, so if we're looking out in our, in our uh, like school grounds here, okay, the area that's covered with grass is going to do a lot of absorption. The track is going to absorb even more. Why? Because it's black. Okay? Now, the parts of the track where the lines are absorb very little. Okay? I actually watched this thing on the, this death race that happens in Death Valley in California and Arizona, and it's a road race. These guys run in the heat of the day in the summertime through the desert on a paved road. They have to run on the white line of the road or their shoes melt. So you see these road guys and they're running and they're do it's almost like a tightrope walk in order to keep their shoes on the white line of the road. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you wouldn't burn like, like sizzle like a frying pan, but, you know, it would be really hot, okay? Like hot enough that the rubber of their of the sh their shoe soles will actually start to soften enough that they'll leave pieces of it on the road. Okay, and actually this happened to my family when I was about 10 years old. We drove down to California to go to Disneyland in our truck and camper, and we got a flat tire. So my dad on the side of the freeway on a day when it was like 38 degrees outside pulls out the jack to start jacking up the truck, and the jack once he gets the weight of the truck on it promptly sinks into the road. Okay? It was that hot. Okay? That the road, the asphalt of the road actually got soft enough that the jack just went and sank down into it. Okay? What's that? Yeah, there are different types of rubber. Like like tires are typically made of different types of rubber. Now, even winter tires and summer tires are made of different types of rubber. If you drove a car with winter tires on an Arizona road in the summertime, you would destroy the tires like that. Okay? That's why you want to get your, your winter tires off before temperatures get above 10 degrees regularly. Otherwise, you're shredding those tires quickly. They're not designed, they're really soft and not designed to operate at that temperature. Okay? Whereas summer tires suck in the winter because they're made of harder stuff that has a higher melting point. So they're not soft enough to grip ice and things like that. So they don't work as well. All seasons is what I'm talking about. They're not as good. Okay. All right. Everybody following me here so far? Yes? Okay. So albedo is an important term. I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to refer to that term all the time because it influences how much energy can be absorbed by an area. All right. 
when we have reflection occur, that energy's got to go somewhere. Some of it goes straight back out into space. Okay? Um, that's why we can see other planets in our solar system through telescopes. They reflect a lot of the light that hits them. Okay? That's why Venus is so bright in the sky. Okay? Most of the light that strikes Venus doesn't get through the cloud cover of Venus. That's why it's so bright and, and brightly colored. It's also closest to us, but okay, it's also reflecting a lot of the light away. Jupiter is big and cloudy, and it reflects a lot of light, so it's easy to see in the sky. Okay? All right. Um, that, some of that reflected light will hit clouds and bounce back. And some of it will hit the greenhouse gases that are in our atmosphere and also reflect back. Now, at that point, people go, oh, yeah, greenhouse effect's so bad. Well, greenhouse effect escalating, that's bad. Greenhouse effect being here, crucial. Okay? If the Earth did not have a greenhouse effect, it would be too cold to live on. Okay? We need to have some carbon dioxide and some methane and things like that in the atmosphere to trap some of the heat. We don't want it all trapped because then we'll end up like Venus and it'll be like the inside of an oven. Okay? We don't want the greenhouse effect to get worse because if it does, then the Earth will get hotter. And it is a little bit. Okay? But we need to have some greenhouse effect in order for Earth to be livable. Right? So don't get the idea greenhouse effect is all bad. Okay? Greenhouse effect escalating, that's bad. Okay? All right. Um, okay, questions on this? Everyone okay with that? Okay, so that's why, obviously, in the wintertime, we got everything working against us in terms of energy. We're tilted away from the sun, like we learned yesterday, okay, which means we have lower intensity light striking the surface, and all of that lower intensity light is bouncing off of highly reflective surfaces and staying cold. Okay? Um, this is why, uh, in the wintertime, we throw sand on the roads. Okay? Sand aids with traction a little bit, but it also changes the color of the, of the snow and ice, makes them darker, and lowers their albedo. Okay? Lowering the albedo means more light gets absorbed. Okay? A high albedo means more light gets reflected, so that's part of the reason we do that. We also throw salt on there because salt lowers the melting point of ice, or sorry, raises the melting point of ice so that it melts at a lower temperature. The combination of salt and sand results in clear roads faster okay, than just throwing one or the other on. Okay. Yeah, if you don't keep your car clean and salt is allowed to stay on your car for long periods of time, it'll start an elect uh, electrochemical reaction with the metals of your car that will result in rust. Yeah. So keep your car clean. All right. So gases present in the atmosphere help maintain the Earth's temperature and climate. So this is the greenhouse effect that we talked about a little bit already. Okay. Carbon dioxide, CFCs, so chlorinated chlorinated fluorocarbons, okay, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, okay, they allow light to go through one way, but they don't allow it to come back the other. It's kind of like, uh, like one-way glass, you know, like they'd use in a police interrogation room, okay, where it looks like a mirror, but there's people watching from behind, okay, and it's, you know, it's suspect number two, you know, and they're identifying in the lineup and things like that, okay, it's kind of like that. Stuff can get through, okay, but it can't get back out, right, so that's what traps some of that heat. Does all of it get trapped? No. Okay, not all of it gets trapped. It's not like Venus, okay, where basically all of it gets trapped. Lots of it still gets back out. Okay, um, all right, so the greenhouse effect is important. But I found this picture the other day, so I just wanted to show it to you. Um, it has to do with the rain shadow, presence of mountain barriers thing you talked about yesterday, okay. Um, on one side of the mountains, you get lots of precipitation, and on the other side of the mountains, it's quite dry. We're in the rain shadow of the Rockies, because okay? as moisture gets pushed up and over the mountains, it condenses on this side and falls. And you can actually see that happening here on Mount Robson. Okay? When you go to, if you ever go to Mount Robson and watch it, stay there for like six hours or so, and just it's, it's neat to watch the stuff that happens there. But clouds will just all of a sudden form out of nowhere. Okay, there'll just be this cloud that suddenly forms on one side of the mountain, okay, and it'll kind of struggle around and over the mountain, and then when it's gone, the mountain will be covered with snow. Okay, so just some warm air mass was moving in, okay, all the moisture was, was water vapor, you couldn't see it, but once it got pushed up the mountain far enough, it all condensed. Okay, it fell on the mountain as kind of a layer of frost and snow, okay, and then disappears as it goes up and over. Right? So it's a good example of the rain shadow effect in a short or a small area. Okay, okay hydrosphere. 
Hydrosphere includes all water on, above, or under the Earth's surface. Basically, all the water on Earth, all liquid water. Okay, so it can be, but sorry, we, we're saying, like I said liquid, but I should say also vapor, although the vapor would be part of the atmosphere, okay, and ice, okay. Ice is important. We don't have glaciers and things like that. We don't have a lot of the fresh water that we take for granted here in Canada, okay. Less than 0.1 of all percent of water evaporated from the surface of the earth actually gets returned to like lakes and rivers and streams or seeps into underground. The rest of it is going to the ocean, Okay, via runoff in rivers, okay, um, or frozen up in polar ice caps, which of course right now are all receding. Okay, um, so it's there's a lot of issue with kind of maintaining fresh water. Okay, um, if I'm looking like on a summer day, okay, it's not really warm today, but okay, uh, if water is evaporating from the surface around here, it is highly unlikely that that water vapor will return to us. Because once it gets into the atmosphere, it's a gas. Gases are very fluid, and they can move easily. So it's unlikely that it'll fall right back down on top of us. It's going to fall somewhere else. Okay? And when it falls somewhere else, it can be absorbed into the ground, or it can run off into a stream or river, which eventually will take it to the ocean. Okay? If it's going into a stream or river, it's not staying there. And it's going to carry it to the ocean, and the oceans will fill up with it. Okay? Now... That's okay, because most of the evaporation of liquid water comes from the ocean. Okay? When we get rain here, it didn't come from here, it came from somewhere else. Okay? Most of the time it's something that luck was lucky enough to get over the mountains before it condensed and fell on them and we get it here. Okay? When we get a convective storm, like a thunderstorm, okay, that was likely evaporated somewhere nearer to us. Okay? That stuff didn't necessarily come from the ocean, but maybe from closer around. Okay. And obviously, we're going to be getting into our thunderstorm cycle here okay, pretty quickly. Now that we've got enough moisture around to drive that, okay, we should be getting thunderstorms a little more regularly for the next two months or so. Okay. Now, the hydrosphere is important because it's got, obviously, part of the water cycle, but it's most important because of this. And we're going to talk about this quite a bit in this unit, latent heat. There's two kinds of heat, sensible heat that we detect as temperature, it's warm, it's cold, okay, and latent heat. Latent heat is like potential energy for heat or for thermal energy. When water evaporates, that takes a lot of energy. If that water vapor gets carried from one place to another, it carries with it all the energy that was required to evaporate it, okay? So actually, when it rains here, we're gaining some thermal energy by that rain happening because when it condenses into a liquid it releases all of the energy that it gained when it turned into a vapor all right so we actually gain some energy in that way from latent heat and it's the water cycle that allows for that latent heat to move all right so if we're starting here at the ocean okay we've got evaporation from the ocean Right? So that takes energy. We now have water vapor that's high in latent heat and high in energy in the atmosphere. And that stuff moves around. Okay? Then it'll start to condense. When it condenses, it will release that latent heat as energy to that area, and it will deliver the precipitation, either snow or hail or rain, okay? whatever that happens to be. Some of that gets caught on a glacier and stays there. Okay? Some of it runs off. So it gets into streams okay, and rivers and things like that. That's what runoff is. Anything that's Water flowing downhill is runoff. Okay, while it's running off, sometimes it you know gets caught up in lakes or or uh, wetlands or things like that. That's where it can be absorbed into the earth. We call that process infiltration. Okay, infiltration is absorption, right, into the earth. That's supposed to have a P in it, isn't it? Absorb. Absorption. Never looks right when I read it. Okay. Um, so we've got absorption into the, into the earth. Now, when you absorb water, okay, it's not like a sponge. Okay, the earth doesn't necessarily absorb water like a sponge. It's more of a, a percolating. So if you've ever watched, like, how coffee gets made, right, they grind up the, the grounds of coffee and the water kind of goes between the grounds and it picks up a lot of stuff 
the coffee as it goes through there. Okay? That's what it's like when water gets absorbed into the soil. Okay? It percolates and moves between the soil particles, picks stuff up like minerals and stuff as it goes down. Right? That's what can eventually recharge wells and aquifers. Okay? How many people live on uh, acreage or farm and have a well? Okay, so quite a few of you. All right? That well gets recharged by precipitation. Okay. If you have wetlands near or around your property, they are very important for recharging your well. Okay. You don't want to be getting rid of them because then that's going to eliminate an area of, of absorption and infiltration that, that was helping you keep your well levels healthy. Okay. Questions on that? All right. So we got the, I mean, I know you've been beaten over the head with the water cycle since you were like you know, six years old or whatever, but okay, this will be one of the last times. Okay, this time we're looking at it not so much from the cycle itself, but more from an energy standpoint. Okay, this is where energy gets gained. This is where the energy gets moved to somewhere else. Okay, we're gaining latent heat here. Okay, and then it gets transferred. Okay, so it moves with wind. Okay and then receives, right? Okay, so as water vapor moves, it carries huge amounts of latent heat and, and energy with it. Okay, and obviously the Earth has been recycling all of the water Okay, on Earth for billions of years. Okay, there isn't inputs of water from other places anymore. I mean, occasionally from an asteroid or something like that, but okay, um, for the most part, we've got all the water still here. Okay, so um, you know, the water in your water bottle could have been dinosaur sweat. Yeah, pleasant thought for you. Yeah. Okay, most of the water on Earth is salt water. It's saline. It's in the ocean. Okay. I mean, we look at rivers and things like that and we go, oh, wow, there's a lot of water here. There's a lot of water in that lake, but it's nothing compared to the amount of water contained within the oceans. I mean, the oceans can be, in some places, 15 kilometers deep, all right? And they cover two-thirds of the Earth's surface. We're talking about a lot of water, okay? We don't have access to that unless it is evaporated from the oceans and brought here via precipitation. Okay, um, we have to rely on obviously the fresh water, okay, which we're getting from rivers, okay, or from lakes or from wells, okay. In Okotoks, we use a little bit of both, okay. We obviously draw some water from the Sheep River, but most of our drinking water is drawn from wells that are recharged by the sheep and the wetlands in the surrounding area, okay. Uh, where does all that water come from? Well, anything that's in a river is coming from a glacier, okay somewhere, snow melt from somewhere, okay? This is the Robson Glacier on Mount Robson, okay? And as with most glaciers around here, it is receding, okay? That means it is getting smaller. It is getting a lot smaller, okay? Um, when my dad and I did this hike, and you can see, it's, you guys were not very old when we did this hike okay, in 2003, okay? Um, we walked past a sign that said, uh, the Alpine Club of Canada in 1902 marked this point as the toe of the Robson Glacier. We were standing in a meadow full of flowers and bushes. We couldn't see a glacier from that sign. We walked another two and a half kilometers before we could see the glacier, another kilometer after that before we encountered it. Okay? So in 102 years, it had receded over three kilometers. Okay? Now that's not just that it got shorter. But if you look at this valley, it also filled that valley. So it's not just getting shorter, it's also losing depth. Okay? So it's a lot of water okay, in 100 years. Okay? This glacier just keeps receding, and they're all doing that. Okay? The only way to get glaciers to grow is to have repeated cycles of really cold weather where they can grow because snow doesn't melt as much in the summer. Okay? We've had a number now of years in a row with abnormally high temperatures. Okay? If we get a few years of abnormally low temperatures, then the glacier might go out a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, cover that. Okay. The lithosphere is the solid parts of the earth. Okay? All of the rocky parts of the earth. Heat does not transfer through the rocky part of the earth very well. Right? Now, there's three ways that heat can be transferred. You probably covered these at some point. Conduction, convection, 
and radiation. Okay, conduction, convection, and radiation are how heat is transferred. Okay. Radiation is any transfer of energy by waves. Okay. Convection is energy transfer through currents and fluids. Okay. Conduction is transfer in solids. Convection is the most important of the three, at least for us on Earth in terms of transferring energy from one place to another on Earth. Okay? Convection currents happen in fluids. Okay? If they happen in the atmosphere, it's moving air. What do we call that? Wind. Okay? When we have wind, it's evidence that convection is going on. What causes all three of these things to happen? the second law of thermodynamics. Energy flows from hot to cold. Okay? These three things help to make the second law of thermo or are the way that the second law of thermodynamics allows heat to move from one place to another. Okay? So in your own house, on the main floor, you've got the little heating vents, okay, that are on the floor, right? Why are they on the floor? Why aren't they on the ceiling? Heat rises. It makes sense to have them down here where the cold air sits. Okay? That way the hottest air encounters the coldest air, and what happens is that hot air rises, okay? and then as it cools, it descends, okay? and then gets moved back up again, so you get this convection current. Hot air rises, cool air descends, you get a current forming a cycle. Okay? That's convection. That happens even on a global scale, which we'll look at here in a couple of days. Okay? Uh, conduction, conduction only happens in solids. It can only happen in solids because it requires particles to be really close together. Okay? In a solid, particles are packed together. And when they move back and forth, they run into each other. And that's how they transfer energy. They collide and they transfer energy to each other. In the same way if you've ever played pool. Okay? When one ball hits another ball, it transfers energy. That's like one atom hitting another atom. They just vibrate back and forth and they hit each other okay? and they transfer energy up. So if you've ever put like a spoon in a pot, a metal spoon, the end of it eventually gets hot because that process, molecule by molecule, has transferred heat from the hot liquid to the end of the spoon. Okay? Is it very fast? Not usually. Depends on the material. Okay? But most of the time conduction is not very good and it's not very efficient. Okay? So we're not, we're not going to be transferring heat from one place to another on Earth by the collision of tiny molecules over hundreds of miles. Okay? It's just not, not going to work over big distances like that. Can wind easily transfer energy over hundreds of miles? Absolutely. Okay, that's why convection is the most important method of heat transfer on Earth. It's moving through the most fluid part of the Earth. It moves most easily over great distances. Okay, radiation. Radiation is important for getting the heat to Earth, but once it's here, it's all about convection. Okay, the only way heat can get here from the sun is by waves from the sun. Okay, but once it gets here, then it's all about convection. All right, so the, the importance of the lithosphere has to do, again, with that albedo thing we talked about. Okay? The role of, of the lithosphere is not about transferring energy, it's about the absorption of energy. Right? It's the thing that's going to be either dark colored or light colored and affect how much energy gets absorbed by that area. Okay? It's also where plants live. Okay? If it wasn't for the lithosphere, there'd be no soil and then there'd be no plants that could capture light and turn it into chemical energy. So the role of the lithosphere is not about energy transfer, it's about absorption and conversion. Okay? The atmosphere will take care of the transfer. Okay, so what's the importance of soil? It's the topmost layer of the Earth's surface. Like we said, layer where plants can grow. It's its own ecosystem. Okay, it's you know going to have um, living things and non-living things in it. That's biotic and abiotic, chemicals. Okay, all that kind of stuff. Okay, this here might not look like soil, but it is. Stuff's growing in it. Okay, mesquite bushes and things like that can grow in even the rockiest, poorest-looking soils. Okay, obviously you know thick, loamy, black-looking soils are better. Okay, but plants can be adapted to grow pretty much anywhere. Okay, when you look at soil, if you ever dug a hole as a kid, 
Okay, you probably noticed that there were layers, right? You had the nice easy to dig through layer and then usually hit clay, right? And that's usually when you gave up digging because it gets really hard to dig through the clay, okay? Um, but if you kept digging, eventually you would start to encounter bigger and bigger chunks of rock, okay? Um, the rock is what we call parent material because it's where soil comes from. Soil is the result of the weathering of rock. Okay, so all the soil that's ever built up was because rocks were breaking down and the, the silt and material from that breakdown is accumulating and plants can grow in it. Which is why as you go further up a mountain, soils get thinner and thinner and the complexity of plants gets simpler and simpler. Okay, you don't see trees generally growing on the top of a tall mountain. Just put it on my desk, Emma, that'd be fine. Okay, um, so is that making some sense there? Okay, I'll, I would expect that, you know, on a multiple choice exam, you'd be able to tell me about the layers of the soil. So there's the top soil, or the A horizon. The B horizon is mostly clay, and underneath that is the parent material. Okay, that's the C horizon, and that's rock, right? Um, why do you suppose there's clay between the top soil and the rock? Why is there always clay there? It has to do with water, yeah. Okay, clay particles are really, really fine. If you take like dried clay, if you allow it to dry and kind of crumble it between your fingers, it almost feels like flour. It's really, really fine. Okay, whereas sand is quite coarse, right? So sand and loam have really coarse particles, where clay is really fine. So when you get water flowing or absorbing, it carries the fine particles through the coarse particles. So it accumulates underneath them. It gets washed down there. All right, we'll talk about that. You will not have a quiz tomorrow. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more on Friday. Or actually, you'll watch a podcast more of it on Friday. Okay.